Thank you. Hello, everybody. Good evening. <laughs> So before we start talking about Achille Interactive, I, wanted, I, I really wanted to, to delve into something really quick. So sure. I was watching some interviews with you, and you said you were very into neuroeconomics. And you said that when you went home to unwind, you'd read uh, neuroeconomics books. So <laughs> <laughs> I looked it up, because I don't know what neuroeconomics is. But um, <clears throat> it's a field that seeks to explain the process of human decision making. So in your leisure time when you were reading up on this subject, did you ever come across a reason why, uh, I guess, uh, brain-wise or wiring-wise, why someone would want to become an entrepreneur? <laughs> um, oh, geez, that's a good question. Um, read a lot of weird facts. Um, <laughs> the one that reminds me closest of that uh, is a book called Iconoclast, which is essentially, um, it, it comes out of Duke research uh, and, and a lot of other research. Um, but, uh, and you may not have wanted a real answer for this, but I'm just gonna go ahead. Oh no, I want a real answer. Uh, okay, good, good, good. <laughs> um, and it's essentially the neuroscience, the neurobiology behind um, people who either get motivated when people tell them they're wrong, uh, or can't do something, or people who just literally don't fire, like the amygdala, um, the fear center, uh, when people tell them they're wrong. Um, and so they've done they've done research on people who are like true iconoclasts, not just you know entrepreneurs, but like yeah. crazy wacky ideas that for a decade everyone not only didn't believe but said was the stupidest thing around. Um, and those people just literally have such strong um, frontal cognitive control, or just no uh, no reaction to the negative. Um, at the neurofiring level, level um, it's pretty amazing. So you can actually boil that down. And so then there's tried to, there's a lot of um, effort around. Well, how how can we harness that? Right? Because <laughs> we get so scared as uh, as humans in this society. If someone says, well, that's a stupid idea, we like our natural reaction is to say, oh God, they're probably right. I might be dumb. So <laughs> we gotta we gotta fight that urge. So that's not a long way of saying hard headed, right? I mean, that... <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Sure. <laughs> Well, it reminds me of that uh, free solo documentary. I don't know if you've seen that yet, where they do a brand scan of this guy. He climbs 3,000 yes. feet straight up, and they do a brand scan. It says his amygdala basically doesn't respond to stimuli. So. Yeah, same thing. <laughs> <laughs> so somewhere between him and there. There's, there's an like analogy you. in there. Yeah. yeah, entrepreneurship, climbing mountains, and possibly falling off. Yeah, of. there you go. So imagine what medicine can be. That was a, an early phrase I saw on your website. I kind of stumbled onto a dev site for Achille. And I, I just, I, God, what, a, what an awesomely ambitious, uh, ethereal thing for a company to say. Imagine what medicine can be. And you know, I was, you know, in healthcare, we talk about the disease state. We talk about solving the end need. But it seems to me that you guys, you're talking about fundamentally changing the experience a patient has with medicine. And so, where does the passion for that come from? And why do you think you guys were the right people to do it, or are the right people to do it? Yeah, I hope we are. Um, where does the passion come from? Uh, we, so I think where, when we founded, you're right, it was right at the dawn of this kind of revolution of digital and medicine, and now we call it digital medicine or digital therapeutics. Um, when we found it, because we we're at the front edge of that, we weren't necessarily thinking about um, the perfect like business solution. Like I think once once industries start to develop a little bit, people are trying to think, well, what's the niche where you can have a perfect business solution? We were on the front edge where we were literally just watching um, the patient experience fade. Um, especially related to neurology, neuropsychiatry. The, you were seeing most pharmaceutical companies pull out of neuroscience. There were a couple big failures in the late 2000s uh, leading into 2010, 2011, um, which is, I mean, it happens in medicine, but um, I think we were so focused on, um, we were so focused on those, those needs of the patient um, and at the same time seeing the ubiquity of smartphones starting to just like rocket ship. Um, and what was crazy when you juxtapose those two things is um, everything about smartphone and digital technology was about optimizing the experience. Everything was about a fit with experience. 
Um, and the digital world has, has essentially maximized that. And what you realize is nothing was about that in, in medicine. So we started with the unmet need for sure. We started with patient need. Um, what got us excited was when you said we might be able to tackle that with technology. Um, I think it might be our DNA. One of my co-founders was an executive at LucasArts, the Star Wars franchise of film. We have folks from both the medicine world and the gaming world. And I think because we had that DNA so early on, we almost we, we heard people saying, oh, just make a, you know, make an application that can stimulate this part of the brain and just put it out there. Um, and or do your clinical trials and it should be fine, it should be successful. And we're like, what a miss, yeah. right? Because the whole point of digital is you can engage someone. Um, so I think from the earliest days, maybe it's that we were made up of um, sort of diverse perspectives from background. Maybe it's that we had some consumer and entertainment DNA. Um, but I think it was just an approach of, we said, let's, to not, let's not just use technology, let's totally maximize what digital can do. Um, and that means experience. So it, imagine what medicine can be is still one of my favorite phrases. Uh, that, and we use it once in a while, kind of informally. Um, but I think it's important because it, we need to spark not just you can treat someone in a different way, you can totally redefine how they feel about their medicine. And I think that that kind of emotional connection is something that um, I, I believe our technologies and digital therapeutics have a, po a potential to do. Um, and people tend to not talk about user experience in medicine. They tend to not talk about how does someone feel. They, they're talking about efficacy and safety. But there's a third pillar. It's like, how are you experiencing this? Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, it, it, I guess it also depends on your vantage point. I mean, clearly, uh, you know, if you're designing a device for a surgeon, there's a lot of talk about feel or, uh, you know, there's a lot of this uh, uh, now in terms of uh, managing chronic disease and things like that. But really, sure. no, not you don't see that specifically. Well, on and it's a different side. feel. It's, it's, yeah, a, it's a different, it's a different it's about, feel. It's about people interacting but it's not really about people interacting with their medicine. It's and it's not usually control. about emotion. Yeah. And we tend, we tend to want to take emotion out of medicine, which is crazy. It's one of the most important things, right? Intervening in someone's health. Um, so we want to put emotion back in medicine. Um, and so the, one of the analogies we use a lot is like, so you might talk about a feel from like, how do you touch something and does it work? You know, does it feel like it fits? Um, when you open your brand new shiny iPhone, there's like an exhilaration that people have, right? There's, and it starts to establish an emotional connection um, with your product. Um, why are we scared to do that in medicine? Like that's what I can't grasp and we have the potential to do it, so we should. So, I mean, this comes out of uh, Pure Tech, which is uh, also here in Boston, which is great. Uh, and, and it's got a very, they have a unique perspective in terms of company creation, product, Creation market, you know, how? So tell us a little, for those of you who aren't uh, versed in sort of how they're how they do. Maybe you could talk about how that helped you guys uh, push you guys out. Yeah, I was um, I was really fortunate. I finished up my PhD and um, and my first job out was uh, with Pure Tech Health. Uh, they used to be called Pure Tech Ventures. Um, and I, so I've been really fortunate to both learn um, entrepreneurship at Pure Tech. Um, as well as, um, in some ways, be uh, shepherded, and I'll talk about that. Um, so PureTech, really unique model, um, pretty amazing model. They're a biopharmaceutical or biotech company um, that kind of has a hybrid approach of starting programs that can either become companies, in the case of uh, things like Achille, or stay internal programs. So they have both you know, investments and, and they're, uh, they've done investments in companies like Achille as we've grown and they have lab space and they have teams of scientists that work on problems and they own 100% of those things. So um, the, the really fortunate thing for PureTech and, and I actually to this day still, as you said, I cringe when people like will say entrepreneur um, because I don't consider myself that. I had a safety net. So Pure Tech, you know, Pure, I was lucky enough to make a salary um, being at Pure Tech and having the kind of access to early capital, which is one of the hardest things, getting a crazy idea off the ground. Um, so there are lots of other people that um, are much more fearless than I am, I'm sure. Um, but I was fortunate enough to be in the right place, right time, and have that ecosystem where um, we stayed within the walls of PureTech. Um, some of my co-founders are PureTech uh, partners. 
Um, and so we were able to get through those early days of no one believing you and people thinking it's a really bad idea um, and proving out some of the early proof points so that we could then uh, grow and attract outside capital. So um, it's a fascinating model that yeah, you're right, they're based right here in Boston. They have a couple dozen companies and programs that they've founded all over healthcare. Um, it's a pretty amazing model. So let's rewind it here, but what was the, so I mean, we've read about Achille, you know, we've, everybody, you guys are sitting on the cusp, hopefully any day now, being the first, one of the, the, you know, one of the first digital medicine companies to be, uh, get a FDA clearance for a, a, a product that treats cognitive disorders like ADHD with a video game interface. Uh, but back then, what was the original thesis statement that you guys started with that led to this journey? So back in 2011, what sure. were you guys doing over at PureTech? I mean, like, what was the problem? Yeah, so we were, we had a few different things um, related to neurological neuropsychiatric conditions. Um, so there's a company right now that's doing very well um, that's a drug for schizophrenia, a combination drug. Um, and we were working on a company uh, that's also still around uh, that, that was working on non-invasive neurostimulation with a, with a medical device um, called Tal Medical. Um, and what, what we got excited about is could we not just do something non-invasive and safe-ish, could we do something totally leveraging technology that um, amazes people? But the, the real thesis statement was, how can we use this iPhone? Um, again, it's really hard to put ourselves in 2011, um, where you know there wasn't an iPhone 10. Um, there was an iPhone 3, and maybe the 4 was coming or something. Um, but uh, how can we use this iPhone and this platform and actually have a disease impact? So the thesis statement was, can we find um, disease modifying treatments. Can we build disease modifying treatments um, through an iPhone? Which sounds crazy, right? I mean, I remember we would we would write things on the wall and laugh. So we're like, can we have can we have something in an iPhone that would clear um, you know amyloid plaques? And we're like, well, that doesn't that's kind of silly. Um, can we have something in an iPhone that would fundamentally um, you know reproducibly change the way your brain functioned? Um, well, that's not that silly because it's kind of learning and experience that molds the brain, but um, how do you do that? So that's really where we started. Um, and basically we spent about a year scouring uh, academics, small companies, um, and we got, before we found the technology that we ended up starting with, um, we were full believers that there was enough understanding of neuroscience out there that we could harness sensory and motor stimulation in a really specific way. Um, we're, I think, again, right place at the right time. We've known for decades that the brain's an electrical organ and a functional organ, but we haven't really been in, able to tap into that except from implantable electrodes. Um, and so we saw just enough research that was telling us someone's going to be able to do this through you know, sensory and motor stimulation alone, and we just had to find it. Seems like a pretty large leap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a large list. <laughs> <laughs> it just kind of dawned on me, like, so just by interacting and looking at it, you can create a, a physical change in the brain, basically, or a chemical change Well, that, in the brain. that was the thesis statement, yeah. right? That was the idea. Um, and I give a lot of credit to some of my co-founders and, and um, Daphne Zohar, who's, um, who's uh, founded Pure Tech, yeah. um, who just, you know, allows and pushes for these crazy big ideas. Yeah, so uh, obviously Daphne is a huge champion. What other champions were there early on saying, no, 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 that's not crazy. You got something there. <laughs> um, it was a, there was a mix. I mean, our, our scientific co-founder, our very first advisor was um, Adam Ghazali. Um, and so he's the inventor of our one of our core technology platforms, the technology that powers our ADHD treatment. Um, he, is, he was already a visionary. He's since become a very public visionary in neurotechnology. He's written books. He uh, speaks all over the world. Um, so he... Uh, obviously believed that he invented a technology. Uh, he had a really broad network in San Francisco of both technology entrepreneurs and others. Um, uh, we had, um, we engaged very early on a, um, there's a funny story behind it, but um, we engaged uh, Daphne Bavier, another Daphne, um, who essentially was the only legitimate researcher that was s trying to seriously study the effects of action video games. And that's kind of how actually the video game angle came to us from the scientific end. She had published, a lot of people don't realize, she's, uh, she had published a Nature paper back in the early 2000s, despite all this morass of um, you know, video games might cause aggression and violence and all that, which there's a lot of research there. Um, she was the sole voice saying, okay, but 
um, people are engaging in video games over time repeatedly and actually look at changing their brain and in some cases for the better, like in visual perception and even contrast sensitivity and vision. Um, and so she, she was at University of Rochester, she's now at Geneva. Um, so we had some early science proponents who were very credible. Um, uh, and then um, we, you know, we, we hunkered down and proved it out. <laughs> so I think we, we, one of my strategies very early on was um, let's not try to perfectly predict the, I guess it's uh, in many ways it's kind of a new technology type of approach. Let's not try to perfectly predict the long range path here. Let's try to put this into a few trials, build a prototype, put it into a few trials, see if we can get data that can convince us and others that there's something real here beyond a little you know, academic study. Um, and that's kind of where we started. So was this, when you saw this paper, was it an aha moment or, or I mean, this, <laughs> was it like a, um, It was an aha moment like seven years late. Okay. Um, <laughs> so the, the funny story is, um, so I had actually come across this paper when I was like early on in grad school um, or maybe in the middle of grad school. Um, and my, um, my advisor at the time, so I was, a lot of people assume I'm either a gamer or a, uh, or a neuroscientist, and I'm neither. Um, I, obviously a hobbyist uh, neuro neuroscience reader. Um, but uh, I'm a biochemist, so I was doing a lot of uh, drug design, drug discovery. Uh, and my advisor, Karen Anderson at Yale, uh, who's an excellent advisor, excellent researcher in anti-infectives, um, I kind of did it as a joke on her. I had seen this Nature paper, and we had Journal Club, like a lot of people have in their graduate labs, and we're usually presenting like really uh, elegant enzymology try, you know, studies that have been published. And so I threw up like I'm I'm totally presenting this video game paper because she was not into video games. Um, she would joke on some of my lab mates if they were ever talking about video games, and so I saw that. But the reason I I presented as I thought it was actually amazing, right? It was yeah. really good research. She was teasing out the mechanisms behind um, what what actions of video games actually lead to different neurological effects. Um, but that was in like 2003 or four, um, maybe five, and uh, and we didn't find Achille till 2011. So yeah. Um, yeah, I didn't really think about it until we were really had that mission statement of like let's try to do something that disease modifies. There was then like the light bulb like probably very very slowly flickered on. And was like, remember that thing? Um, so it was like post hoc light bulb. Yeah. I, it strikes me that, I mean, it's, you kind of took like a, like a dump, like two or three incredibly hard things to try here. Uh, first, you try to start an entirely different category of medicine. And then, you know, not only are you trying to prove that, but then you have to build a video game. How, how did you go about building? out the right people to do that. Because it's not like, I mean, you know, I'm 43 and you know, I loved Space Invaders when I first saw it, but I mean, you know, <laughs> kids today, they're a little more advanced. Uh, yeah. How, how do you, I mean, how did you start this? Um, we still to this day have a philosophy that we need to invest just as much in the science as the um, entertainment experience. And I think where you've seen a lot of health tech, if you will, fall early on, um, is they said, well, we're a healthcare company and we're, you know, we'll put some colors on top. Um, or the opposite, a lot of technology companies that are a technology company say, I don't know, we'll do, you know, we'll add a little bit of science and we'll say it's based on science. Yeah. Um, we've, we've always had the philosophy that to do this right for patients, to, to make sure it's something that they both want to use and that actually helps them. Um, we've got to do both right. So we've, uh, I use the word a lot. Um, I think my investors get it now, but we overinvest in the experience um, just as much as we overinvest in clinical trials. It's a prudent investment, but depending on what side of the aisle you sit on, you tend to think it's an overinvestment. Um, we early on, uh, we, we still get people from all, all over the place. So you'll, if you join a uh, random meeting at Achille, sometimes you'll be in a meeting with people who have developed medical devices and drugs and are an artist and um, you know, some data engineer that's built um, you know, the, the data display behind Burning Man. I mean, these are actual like people that we have in our company. Um, and so it's diversity of perspective and experience, I think that is really the core, but people that really live and are passionately about, are, are passionate about their backgrounds and bringing that to what we're trying to build. Um, so I think where we would have failed is if we said, you know, we're a medicine company, everyone we get is from medicine and let's consult on the experience or vice versa. Right. We're a medicine company and a technology company. We're a clinical company 
and an entertainment company. How, how did you find your co-founder? Is it uh, Todd O'Mernick? Uh, Matt. Matt, Matt O'Mernick. Yeah, 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 yeah. So he was creative director at Lucasfilms? Yeah, he was, was just like a, a buddy of yours? Or uh, actually, you? interestingly, through Adam Ghazali, through our co-founding scientist. Um, they had known each other in San Francisco for some years, had always been fascinated by each other's work. They had run across each other. Uh, Matt was actually executive creative director at LucasArts, so he sat at the executive table with George Lucas for years, uh, building out all of the media content video games behind it. So um, I remember we, uh, so Adam Ghazali, once we were founding the company, and Adam was like, yeah, this is great. Um, once we licensed the technology, for, or we're licensing the technology from UCSF, um, I was talking about building out both our science and, and our very early, we were gonna hire like three people, yeah. right? Um, so our scientist and you know someone on the game design side, and he said, you should really talk to my buddy Matt. Um, and so I met him in a uh, little picturesque Sausalito just north of San Francisco over the Golden Gate. Um, and I remember we sat down and literally it was like four and a half hours later, we had, I think we had two full meals because we just kept yeah. going. Um, and I was having that meeting to see if Matt was even remotely interested. At the time, he was the total creative lead for um, the Star Wars Connect video game. Yeah. So he was literally flying between um, Lucas in San Francisco and Microsoft, because it was a joint venture in Seattle, and down to LA for the creative and back. He was doing this every week. So I caught him one day in between, and I was gonna pick his brain like, hey, can we involve or do you know people? And by the end, he was like, all right, I'm all in if you want to do this. Um, so I guess a little bit of Italian food, or a lot of Italian food, goes a long way. Was this before or after uh, they sold to uh, Disney for? This is before. Oh, this is okay. before. Yeah. So you might owe them a little bit, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, people don't realize George Lucas owns 100 percent. Oh well, then you, then he owes you. <laughs> <laughs> So were your investors were they like no 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 just just invest in the in the in the core health technology and don't don't be bringing in high priced talent to you know to for what could some maybe mistakenly say is maybe not the primary goal. Uh, not our investors. I mean, some investors. We we had investors on both sides of the aisle. Again, you you need to look for the rare investor that gets the dual uh, nature of this. Um, we had some investors early on um, that sure they were like, you know, look, you have a cool medicine product, just just do something quicker. More often than not, we actually they were like, just put it on the app store. This was the time where everyone thought you could make something quick, throw it on the app store, make a couple bucks as a wellness app, right. and they're like, and your thing actually works, so put it out, it'll probably be good. And I'm like, yeah, that's exactly why we're not gonna put it out, like yeah. just randomly. Um, so no, I mean, our investors got it from early on. We, again, because of uh, the pure tech model, we were lucky enough to be really choosy with investors. We turned some investors away who seemed to say the right things, but you could tell we're viewing the like Silicon Valley quick flip type yeah. thing. Um, and it's not what we wanted to build. I mean, you alluded to it in the intro, which was really nice, but um, we've always said we wanna build um, the dominant digital medicine company um, that has a portfolio of products that's helping patients across all sorts of disorders. Um, we're not, we weren't in this to like flip something, yeah. to flip an app. And, and the core technology we're talking about that you license out of UCSF, I don't know if, if I, I kind of asked you to drill down on that, maybe you could just kind of explain a little bit for, sure. for the less scientifically inclined <laughs> me. Sure. Uh, you know, what, what actually the core Yeah, so the, at a basic level, what Achille does generally, even independent of that technology, our, our thesis is we take algorithms, our technologies are algorithms, that can render certain types of sensory motor stimulus tasks to users through the, uh, through the iPad. And we believe they're the best algorithms in the world for stimulating very specific um, neural networks, functional neural networks. Um, so this technology, the first one we found at the company around uh, out of UCSF, was um, a technology that essentially um, combines multiple stimuli, both choice uh, stimuli that jump up on the screen and fine motor stimuli, um, that uh, essentially makes someone multitask, for lack of a better word, in a very specific way at a very high level. Um, and it's adaptive. And, and it comes, it, that's a very dumbed down version of it. Um, what it essentially targets is what's known as the brain's interference processing system, um, which is right now is actually pretty low interference. It's an interesting example, but um, we're up here, presumably people might be paying attention. Um, there's lights around here, there's some sounds, there's the vents, but we as humans do, we have to actively, people don't realize it because it comes automatically, we actively uh, decide what we want to focus on and try to silence or suppress everything else in the environment that's irrelevant to our goals. Um, 
the hardest thing that that part of the brain, it's midline prefrontal cortex based, the, that system, the hardest thing it has to do is deal with multiple things at once, right? The brain would much rather say, forget all that stuff, let me focus over here. Um, and so what, we, what the technology forces someone to do is process multiple things at the same time, second by second adapting, getting harder every moment, um, but not letting someone um, remove that tension. And so uh, the, the neuroscience, it was actually, uh, after we licensed it, it published as, it was the cover story uh, on Nature in 2013. Um, I believe it's still like the third most highly cited nature paper of the last decade. Um, and so it's very high science. There's a lot more underneath it. Um, but the general concept is it's constantly rendering adaptive um, stimuli that a user has to process at the exact same time. And we've reproduced both um, through that lab and, and we've done some studies in children as well that showing that after a month of treatment, um, that midline prefrontal cortex, whereas in, for instance, children with ADHD, it's very, um, uh, I'll say it's cold, it doesn't activate efficiently. Um, when you show them a stimulus after a month of treatment, it, this part of the brain now activates very strongly. So they're basically bringing online resources um, to be able to filter out what's not important and focus on what's important. So that's the concept behind um, that, uh, that sort of strengthening of that system. And that's different from Adderall and Dexedrine also? <laughs> um, yeah, so what's, what happens in the drug world, is, it's kind of the other half of the puzzle. Um, I mentioned that the brain is obviously an electrical and functional organ. Uh, the brain has receptors. So what uh, stimulant medication and all other medication for the brain does is bind receptors. Um, the downside is, of course, it's very poorly targeted. So um, drugs are not targeted to specific neural regions. They're targeted to receptors, which essentially, simplifying, but essentially are coded all over the brain. And so it's absolutely no um, surprise that in across neurology, across neuropsychiatry, you either get sometimes low efficacy or more often than not significant side effects because it's, it's just poorly targeted. Um, and so uh, what we can do with technology is uh, target a lot better. And so through functional intervention, through fun functional experience and stimulus, um, we're able to target certain neural networks, um, we believe, um, better than you can with medication. Uh, it's a different profile. Yeah. We're not, uh, you know, in some ways, and we've seen this in our clinical trials, there's not the kind of immediate, you know, crazy impact that you see when someone uh, takes Adderall, for instance. Um, but, but that's not how we're trying to work on the brain. We're trying to slowly over time strengthen it. And it strikes me as, you know, we're talking about the patient's experience with medicine, that not being medicated also is another way maybe to, not being medicated in that traditional sense that I'm on prescription medication every day maybe changes the kid's, uh, I don't know, confidence or something like that, yeah. or there's a stimuli, I mean, a, a sort of a stigma that they get uh, being on, being every day, having to take, you know, Adderall or these other drugs for their It's condition. really interesting, yeah. Um, so it depends. We're, we're a portfolio company. We have a number of products. Pediatric ADHD is our first. Um, each of those patient populations is different in terms of their needs, in terms of how they experience their condition, how they experience the world. Um, I think the common thread there is that, um, and I want to caveat all this with saying we're not anti-pharmaceutical. We actually have pharmaceutical investors. We just partnered last week with a pharmaceutical company. I believe that for some children and for some adults, um, pharmacology targeting CNS disorders is critical. It's transformed lives. Um, but there are significant portions of these populations who um, either won't take medication or can't take the medication. There's dose limiting side effects. Um, and the fascinating part here, the common thread between all these populations is um, essentially 10 out of 10 of um, patients here, including the ones who are well managed, say, I just wish there was some alternative. Now that's not to say that they should, that every patient in ADHD should consider using a digital medicine if there was an approved one instead of pharmacology. That's not the point. It's just having something else in the toolbox um, that can allow someone, however they want to perceive it. If some people feel like medication is right for them and they derive confidence and they have a positive life in that, great. A lot of people want something else. Um, one of the most common things you hear um, with uh, ADHD families, which is, is a little bit heartbreaking, is that struggle, that choice. A lot of times parents feel like they have to choose between helping their child, um, um, but potentially a, a phrase, putting out a spark putting out you know, a personality spark. And that's not true across the board, but that's the perception. So you're right, there is a kind of societal Or there's a drive fear. Here. There's a fear. Or there's, there's a fear. Yeah. 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 That's fascinating. So w 
business sort of uh, to be inelegant, I mean, so what we go to, you know, let's assume everything goes right, and this is how, how do we, how do patients pay for, for the product? How is it, uh, it's not an app, as you said, so it's a prescription model, and, and how does that, how does that work? Yeah, that's right, we're, um, we're under review as a prescription treatment. Um, we do believe it would be the first uh, digital product that has a core, uh, a pure treatment label, standalone, this is for the treatment of Condition X. Um, which we're excited about, so it would be prescription only, um, and that's to ensure it gets to the right people and connects through the doctor. So a lot of people have a misconception that um, in digital therapeutics and digital medicine, it's trying to disintermediate the doctor. Um, that's not the case at all. We want to include the doctor. We want to actually empower the doctor to have a, to have a new tool to treat their patient um, or to help. Um, we may want to disintermediate the pharmacy. That's a different story, um, but. Um, <laughs> but um, that's, that's kind of the, the concept is we want to include um, with the doc. And so uh, we actually want, uh, I have a phrase I like to use a lot, which is we want um, our product uh, should be uh, nothing like today's medicine and should be exactly like today's medicine. And what I mean by that is in some things, like when you say the business model or, or um, how someone sort of uh, from a payment perspective mentally views this, um, it's a treatment, right? And, and just because it happens to be downloadable, um, we don't wanna invent a new process for patients. We think that just adds more burden and it's more cumbersome for doctors. So doctor prescription, um, uh, insurance reimbursement, because this is a medical treatment, um, that's part of our model. And so, you know, it's a little bit wacky of a product compared to drugs. So will this happen, you know, day one? Probably not, um, but it's, it's what we're aiming for and we think we can get there. And so they would get the prescription for the app, or would they get an iPad uh, <laughs> all in this? Yeah, um, ideally, right, the, the ideal here with digital is, um, you know, they can have an app through various means that you can download, right? There are different stores, there's websites, et cetera. Um, and that uh, ideally, um, they can activate, you know, yeah. through a code that's a prescription code, right? So, uh, and that activates the real treatment um, for a patient or family. Um, there's always, the, the one thing people don't talk about in digital a lot is, um, and, and it's, we're, it's acute to us because we have a really high graphical content treatment. Um, so we, we kind of are pushing the edge of the graphics. It's fast paced, high graphic quality. Um, and so there are just always going to be families and patients that don't have kind of a new enough iPhone, right? There's, there's a lot of people in this country that don't have touch screen smartphones. Um, and so obviously we're committed to um, providing, you know, tablets or, or um, devices or helping them get devices that run the treatment. Um, but I think that will actually go away in the next handful of years too, as, as those um, go from like 80% of the population to 100%. Um, I think it takes care of itself. It, strike, it just struck me, like I said, we are so early in this process and I'm like, so do you get an iPad with the prescription? <laughs> like, like we it's, are- They're really, the right questions. No, but I mean, we like, yeah. we're so, the, 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 like you said, 2011, like we're, we're yeah. eight years into this whole new, like yeah. arena. Well, and so what I like to like, well, how how do I get the stuff? Yeah. Right? Like, well, well, what year was it? Right, and I don't know the answer to this. Um, what year was it when someone said, "Wait, so I have to go to a farm and I'll get a pill bottle?" Yeah. And then what? Right, it, like at some point that was that happened, right? Because it used to be door to door, and that, so that's like I think that's exactly where we are. Yeah. And I hope we look back in a decade or two, yeah. and it's kind of like, oh, so did you, you know? you walk out from the doctor and it's like, oh great, you get a digital prescription today? Or did you get a, you know, what, what kind of treatment did you get? Yeah. Um, assuming that probably they got a digital treatment. Right? <laughs> so um, uh, I hope we get there. It's a couple years off. Yeah, so I mean, that, that'll bring me to, to my last question here, which is, sure. you know, um, recently we discussed digital health and its relationship to pharma slash med tech. And you said, had a great sort of phrase to me. You said, you know, uh, sort of still being considered the toy in the happy meal and not the actual Happy Meal itself, right? So the digital piece is just like the little add-on you get when you get, you know, the burger and the fries here. Um, let's go really big picture. Sure. What questions about digital medicine and this new vanguard of medicine have already been answered? And what are the big questions that we still have to answer? It's a good one. Um, I think some basic questions like, should we run clinical trials? Can we run clinical trials? Can we validate these types of treatments? Those have been answered. 
Um, so the answer is, it's not that it's always going to work, but just same thing as a drug. Uh, the answer is yes to all of those. We should be doing that. Um, and so we've, uh, in many ways, taken the heavy lift in this industry by running prospective, multiple prospective clinical trials pre-market with the actual form factor of the product that will go in patients' hands. Um, so that's, that's kind of a lot of people, I mean, we get called constantly now by new companies popping up in the space who are basically saying, well, we're obviously doing clinical trials, but we want to learn, you know, how we should do that. So I think that's kind of answered. Can FDA enable this? Um, I think that's been answered. You've seen a couple products um, get FDA clearance in the last few years. Slightly different things that are more like behavioral therapy or disease management put into an app, but awesome um, for patients. Um, and so I think those kind of the first steps in the, medic the, the getting a medicine to market have been answered. Yeah. Um, we have not yet seen uh, scalable digital medicine, right? If anything, we're seeing some early players testing some early commercial models. We're certain, we hope to be launching, you know, in the next year. Um, we will be testing a model. I like to tell everyone I'm pretty sure we're going to fail on a lot of things when we get out there and we're going to learn a lot that we didn't know. There's just not a tried and true path. There's no train track to run down. Um, and I think you need to invest in this like both a, a drug and a consumer technology. So yet again, a heavy lift. Um, but what are going to be those key barriers to people using a digital treatment long term? What are going to be the key uh, sticking points to people staying on treatment? What are going to be those, um, those logistical ecosystem um, levers that um, that you can actually serve a patient better, that you can remove their friction. Um, we have hypotheses, but we don't know. And I think we're, everyone, you know, it's so early in this industry and you have a couple big players now starting to get products out. Um, I think there's just a lot we don't know. Yeah. But you kind of like it like that, right? Yeah, it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, Eddie, thank you so much. Uh, that was really fascinating. I want to actually, since we have kind of an intimate forum here, we, sure. can, we can, would you mind answering yeah, a couple yeah, questions? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. This is really interesting. Um, you know, I'm wondering, there are, sorry, uh, with, with sort of the convergence of digital and med tech, you know, it's such a fast growing field. And I think one thing we're all paying attention to is how are regulators responding to it? Um, how is the highly regulated field of medical devices interacting with consumer devices? Um, what has been your company's experience uh, in interacting with them? Um, generally very positive and we're currently under review which means I probably won't say too much at all about it um, and I'm certainly going to be very positive um, no it's, it truly has been positive so we when we went to sit down with the FDA um, and I think I believe it was early 2014 um, you know this was um, this was pre Scott Gottlieb we're now post um, but this was pre by a couple years um, and the first response we actually got was, uh, it was trying to be helpful. It was saying, well, if you just don't want to say treat and ADHD, then this can be a consumer product. And we were like, okay, fair enough, but we kind of want to treat ADHD. So, um, and we want to we want to tell people that. So, uh, but they were great. They said, great, then come on in. So we had multiple uh, pre-submission meetings with FDA where we sat down, we worked through our technology. We we actually designed our uh, pivotal trial, which was a first of its kind, 20 site nationwide trial where uh, children were going home with an iPad uh, that had one of two potential treatments on it instead of a pill that was either drug or placebo. Um, so we, we brainstormed that with the FDA. We designed it. We sat with them. We went through little logistics like how exactly should the uh, site blinding when there's a backup raider because the main raider's out and the clinician is on vacation. I mean, we went through these details um, and it's been, it's been great. Um, we sat down with them after our, our pivotal trial and had uh, a room of about a dozen folks at FDA that we spent an hour and a half with just going over, um, going over everything. So I think the interest has been high. I think the receptivity to be open to industry and you've seen this with a lot of now the outward programs that they've given um, after interacting with companies like ours and, and the other leaders here um, in putting out guidance and even putting out programs that are much more receptive to technology and realizing that technology is different, it adapts. I sat on a panel with someone from FDA at Bio last year um, and, uh, and she kind of, to everyone's like awe and amazement, she said they love working with companies like Achille or Paratherapeutics who was on the panel or others. Um, 
who actually say, no, we want to adapt our medicine on the market. We want to change it because it can. And they said, absolutely, like this makes sense. We just have to learn how. Um, so it's, I think it's been a very positive experience. Um, you know, we're, uh, the, the one thing I can say is um, they don't mess around. And so uh, you've seen this with other products that have come out. They are upholding a very high bar. They're scrutinizing clinical data. Um, they are limiting claims in this space to, to narrow them just like they would a drug or a traditional medical device. Um, so I think they're doing exactly what they should do, um, which is setting a high bar but being open to progressive thought. So um, over the last couple of years, I've been working with the DOD on uh, brain trauma, PTSD, brain injury. And you know, so similar to some of the things you've done, we've been looking at gaming. There's a company out of San Diego, we've been doing some gaming for therapeutic uh, effects and, and being a big believer in transcranial stimulation, some of those things, we started looking into doing some pairing. So I'm curious if you guys are delving into the area of um, memory reconsolidation with uh, propanol hydrochloride or you know, FDA right now is in class three trials for MDSA, uh, MDMA for PTSD and stuff like that. But as you know, those drugs have to be paired with a treatment regimen. You can't just give somebody MD, you know, uh, MDMA yeah. or hydrochloride, you know, propanol and expect it to work. You have to activate the brain to be receptive to that. Right. Are you looking in the in those areas given that literally ecstasy, MDMA, is going to be a federally approved treatment in North America and all of Europe in probably two years. Yeah, it's a fascinating trend. I mean, I think um, with esketamine uh, that just came out, with you know, psilocybin is now entering deep trials, MDMA. Um, it's a really fascinating field of neurology. I think we're going to see from digital and from molecular, we're seeing kind of a, a well, well, I was going to say we're actually seeing a um, kind of rebirth, a renaissance, if you will, in both of these areas, like electrical stimulation and molecular. Um, we are not actively studying um, uh, with those types of molecules. We do have a study ongoing that's a combination with uh, medication and ADHD, um, where, uh, where we're going to look at the kind of additive or potential synergistic effects. I think, um, like any legitimate treatment, once there's something out there, the potential to combine and see if there's synergy makes a lot of sense. And so, you know, two drugs, yes. Um, a drug and, uh, you know, TCS, yes, try it a drug and a digital treatment. The, these things should be tried, but you need to get it there first. Um, so we're very interested in, you know, what we're, what we're most interested in is that we are bringing uh, to market products that are validated, that truly help patients dramatically, that change their lives. Um, and if we do that well and create this pillar of, of our products and others that are digital treatments, I think the potential to then think about different combinations, it enables that. Um, but we're still doing that foundational work to make sure that what we have is truly um, helping patients. Hi. So back in 2011, when you were holding an iPod, or an iPhone, uh, there was someone next to you who could turn theirs on and you'd see a little pineapple there. And it was jailbroken where you could download any app you wanted. Can you just comment on the security measures in the digital pharmaceutical world and how you're trying to address that? Yeah, it's very, very important. I mean, I think this is um, cybersecurity, general data protection, um, it's important um, because, yes, the treatment is on the phone. It's also important because um, I met, we talked about the experience and, and doing fully leveraging what digital can do. The other thing that we believe is fully leveraging what digital can do means data. So we actually scrape data frame rate on the device. So we get 30 FPS, 30 frames a second data on our treatment, and we get data from parents and caregivers, and we meld all those data. So to be able to use the data well to then help and serve patients and, and change your products for the better, um, then you need to have all those measures in place. So I think it's really important. Um, the, the one thing I can point to, um, uh, we're a um, co-founder of the Digital Therapeutics Alliance, which is the first industry organization of digital therapeutic companies. Um, so it's Achille and WellDoc, Pair, Voluntis, uh, Propeller, and now um, and a dozen other companies, uh, some pharmaceutical companies, et cetera. Um, and one of the core, um, uh, I don't want to say, it, one of the core criteria uh, to being in that is that there are demonstrable measures that you've taken that are in line with the highest level of security standards. So um, it is absolutely something that is important. I think the good companies that are doing real medicine are taking it seriously from what I've seen, and I think that's very important. Um, I was going to say, behavior change is really hard, and I'm um, talking now about physicians. <laughs> um, how are you, you know, they're used to writing scripts, they're used to doing procedures, this is new for them, so how are you 
Yeah, it's um, this is one of those unknowns uh, of you know how how tough will it be to change behavior um, from physicians. Um, it's interesting. We've been surprised by how receptive the physicians are. Um, so, uh, on looking at like a single target product profile of our clinical data and our treatment. Um, they don't all get it. Uh, you have a distribution. We've had, we literally, one of the first physician calls uh, I joined and listened to, um, someone said, um, what is this, glorified Pac-Man? You're kidding me if I'm gonna prescribe this. And I was like, oh, this is not going well. It was like, <laughs> you know, it was like 50-50 at that point. It was one of the first two physicians we heard from. Um, but that turned out to be an outlier. Um, not everyone really deeply gets it, some do. Um, people who have been trained a bit more in the neuropsychiatry field do, psychology do. Um, your average prescriber, somewhat. Um, the good thing is, in these areas, ADHD, depression, they've heard of alternative treatments. They've, most of them have even investigated a little bit on behalf of their patients. Um, but there's really not much out there that's legitimate that they can do. So um, what I think is on day one, will physicians, will prescribing physicians be overwhelming advocates of our approach? No, I don't think so. I think behavior change is hard. I think most you know, physicians have done a very good job managing different patients, in the case of ADHD, children with ADHD, um, pretty well with the tools at their disposal. Um, but they are all aware of the fact that um, almost every new patient in, oh, I died that almost every new, this happens to me all the time when I talk. <laughs> I just keep going. Um, uh, almost every new patient or family in the office at least asks, is there something non-drug here? Uh, they're very aware that a big chunk of their patients, you know, approaching 50%, have had to stop using medication or have had adverse events. So the needs they've seen, um, and I think, look, doctors are doctors. We, we tend to be skeptical in the system, but they're, most of them are there to care for patients. Um, and when we pair that up, when the, what they tend to say about our product and market research is, okay, this is legitimate, I see it, it's credible. Um, look, if a patient wants this, um, and if I feel like I can help them, sure, I'd consider prescribing it. So the rubber meets the road when it's out there, and you know, they know how to write an easy prescription. Um, but um, physician behavior, uh, it's, it's partly sort of their mindset, it's also partly the front office. Um, so one of the things, we didn't talk about it much, but we've invested really heavily, yet another overinvestment of Achille, um, to build our own uh, commercial access and distribution platform because we feel like what's out there for drugs is not appropriate. Um, and one of the reasons we want to do that is so we can optimize every touch point and reduce friction. One of the key ones is actually not with the physicians, it's with the front office staff. Um, because it's the front office staff in, in sort of general practice that's really dealing with patient inquiries and how do you get them the treatment. Um, uh, so um, if we were to throw this over the transom to someone to push it through the old way to do medication, I think that would be bad. But I think there's enough receptivity that if we can be adaptive and flexible for them and guide it a little bit, I think we'll get there. Great. Well, I really want to thank you for joining us tonight. I think, um, I think we're going to look back on this and be like, wow, I can't believe we got, we got Eddie to come here and speak <laughs> for us for that. So that was really great. Um, let's give Eddie a round of applause for Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.